All right, here we go. We have basketball legend Ray for Alston, a.k.a. Skip to my Lou, the first player to go from street ball to the NBA. Welcome to Vlad TV. Uh, thank you, man. Thanks for having me. Hey, man, big, big longtime fan, man. And, you know, congrats on the on the barriers that you broke in this game. Indeed, indeed, man. Yeah. Well, this is your first time here, so I want to start in the very beginning. So you grew up in Southside, Queens. Yes, sir. Southside Jamaica, Queens. That's right. That's right. Southside Jamaica, Queens. Yeah, you got, you got to put that, that in there. For <laughs> all the Queens, right, all the New York City, you got to know Southside Jamaica, Queens. <laughs> okay. And... Um, I mean, what was what was Jamaica Queens like during the during the eighties? Man, Jamaica Queens, rough, rough. Uh, the height of the the you know crack epidemic. Uh, um, neighborhoods were being you know I would say in so many words destroyed, uh, brought down um, during during that time. Um, you know, the one thing we, we, you know, when you're living in the industry, living in those type of environments, you hang your hat on uh, uh, sports, you know, and, and uh, for a guy like myself, basketball was like my, uh, my sanctuary is where, you know, I knew, you know, that's where I, I should be. That's where I belong. That's where I was going uh, the whole time, you know, as, as you're navigating through those environments and through them streets, um, you know, so that, you know, sports, uh, Basketball was what, was what I was able to uh, gravitate to. Well, you had four siblings. At three, so it was four of us initially. Four of us. So my older okay. brother, who, when I was born, I didn't get a chance to meet. He uh, passed away in a car accident, and then I have a twin sister, and I have another uh, brother. Uh, so it was it was it was three. So it was three of us my whole lifetime growing up. It was my sister, my twin sister, and my uh, brother, who's older than me by a year and a half. Okay, and your mom was a nurse. Yep, yep. My mother was the RN most of my life. Uh, okay, so you have, and you're primarily living with your mom because you said that your dad was sort of in and out. Yeah, so you know, it, uh, you know, my dad was around. You know, I want to say up until I was ten years old, and and, and that's when eleven, and we had moved. Uh, to a different side of town, we, we actually moved from one side of Jamaica Queens to a, to another. We went from we, we moved from one rough area to a, a rougher <laughs> and tougher area. It was around that time that you know I started seeing you know my dad not really being there on a consistent basis. You know sometimes months I can go without seeing him. Uh, um, but but you know you grow up in the neighborhoods and environments, and you're forced to face reality and you're forced to understand circumstances and. Uh, situations at an early age uh, and and you come to grips with them you kind of respect it well you had mentioned that your your dad had some drug problems indeed indeed okay so he got caught up in that 80s yeah, yeah. crack epidemic base but you know uh to my dad's defense to everyone else's defense out there that was dealing with all that uh you know going through drug addiction with that it could have happened before that you know what I'm saying? Because you know I'm born in 1976, so it could have happened before that. You know, my dad also went to the Navy. You know what I'm saying? So I don't know when it actually started. I know when your eyes and mind is open to it, and you finally come to grips with what it what life is really is for an individual. You understand at that point. I mean, how rough was that? You're a kid, and your father, who who you look up to more than anyone else. You start realizing he's having issues. He's disappearing for months at a time, and your mom is struggling, working two jobs to try to support that many kids. Right? I mean, what were you going through? So it, it's rough. It's rough. Uh, it, it's it's a weird thing because you're going through it, and then you look to the left and to the right of you, your peers. They're going through the same things. It's the it's a it's a it's a situation that. It's unfortunate that has become normalized in the neighborhood because the very next kid that you're hanging out with, they're probably going through the same thing. So for me, it was rough, but you knew how to make it make a way through it. But it's rough, you know, when it really becomes uh, the, the toughest times is when you have a function in school. 
and you know you want the parent the, the school wants the parents to come and you know your dad won't make it or it's rough when you have a basketball game and you're one of the baddest young 10, 11, 12 year old kids in the neighborhood and the whole neighborhood is glorifying you. are like, man, it's going to be the next kid up. And your dad or no one is at the, the games and they can't come to the games. So those times is when it's the toughest is because now you're like, wow, the other kids, dads and, <laughs> and moms is at the game, but you know, you're the best one on the team and you're, you know, no one knows who your dad and mother is because of, you know, actually, you know, their own life circumstances, and situations. Yeah, well, it's tough, but look what ultimately grew from that environment. Right, you right. You know, with you, yeah. So that's the thing, but see, that's the thing, Vlad, is that unbeknownst to us as the young kids that are in, that are put in these situation environments, because you got to remember, you, you, you know, you, we, kids, we born, we didn't, we didn't ask to be here. We also didn't ask to be in this type of environment, you know. So what happens to us when you're growing, like I grew up in South Side Jamaica, Queens, you you know, we end up learning survival tactics. And that's, what's, that's what happened for a person like myself. And thus, I had the opportunity to go through all that, you know, and you know, you as, and through, through life, you learn how to survive. So, you know, when I face tough times, it, it you know, if I can go through that as a child, then I should be able to handle things nowadays as an adult. So that's what happens to us. And again, it's unfortunate that, you know, you're young, you're 10, 11, 12, 13, going through, you're not even living the normal adolescent and young teenagers' lives. You know, I got kids now and I'm looking at them now, I'm like, man, what I was doing at 12, whew. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's mind boggling to, to, to think back you know, the kids right now, you know, they're, you know, they're playing the little video games pretty much all day. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm like, that wasn't even an option for us at 12 and 13 years old. Well, you said at five years old, you picked up a basketball and it just came natural from that point on. Natural, natural as is, is, is can be. Natural as can be. I, you know, till this day, I don't know if my dad took me and put the ball in my hand. I want to say he did. I, you know, obviously I don't remember exactly who put the ball. I know I was five, six years old. And when it was introduced to me, I, I picked it up. It was just natural, you know, uh, not double dribbling, not doing with two hands. They showed me to dribble one and I was, it was just, it came, it became a natural thing. And, and from that time on, from the first time it was uh, introduced to me, I, that's, that's what I wanted to do. That's all I wanted to do. It's all I wanted to be. <laughs> and uh, by the time I was, I want to say seven going on eight, my birthday's in the summer. So I was turning eight and they were having this tryouts. Uh, uh, God bless the soul, a guy by the name of DeBron Murray. He was having a tryout in the park that I would go to every day in the summertime, in the morning. I would get up every day, seven, eight o'clock in the morning, eat a bowl of cereal and just run across it to this big street, uh, Merrick, Merrick Boulevard to this park called St. Elmo's Park, right? And he was having these trials all all ages, from my age all the way up to high school kids. And when he laid eyes on me, he was just said, he came to me, he just said, I've, he's coached and been around a lot of players since they were young. And he said, he ne he said I, I'm probably going to be the next one that makes it, make it out of here. And I, and I haven't said at that time, I don't know what he's really talking about. Cause I'm like, man, I'm just a kid. I'm happy to play ball. I just want to go, you know, when they were having the trials, the funny part about it, I was mad that they had the trials in this part because they're taking up the court that I like to come play on. So I'm like, oh, I can't, play, I can't shoot on a goal. I can't shoot on a court that I want to play on because <laughs> they're having, he's having his trials in the park. Well, around that time, you know, by the time you turn about 11, 12 years old, right. Uh, you know, the whole drug scene in in Jamaica and Queens are is going crazy. You got the Fat Cats, you yeah. got the Supreme Teams, yeah. you know, you got the Pappy Masons and so forth. And they would sponsor these big basketball tournaments. Yes, sir. And you had a coach, I guess, at your elementary school. Oh, man, my coach, one of the uh, God bless his soul, named Greg Vaughn. Greg Vaughn, God yeah. bless his soul, man. Uh, another guy who had the chance to see me at a young age. I went to the elementary school. He was the coach of the basketball team. He was the phys ed teacher. And 
so when at, at the school, we would play intramurals, class versus class, and everything. It would be wiffle ball. It could be uh, kickball. It was a uh, 50-yard dash. We, it was class versus class. And every sport, football, every sport, I, was, I excelled in. You know, I was a gifted athlete, um, and he just couldn't believe it. But the part that he couldn't believe was when it came time for basketball. And he couldn't believe that I was a fourth grader and I was dominating the sixth graders. And he couldn't, he couldn't believe it. Now, at this time, I had no idea that this guy, I mean, he was known throughout the, the neighborhood. He was a great guy, great man, uh, cared for the kids, cared for everybody. Uh, I had no idea he was the referee in these very same tournaments that these, the, the big time hustlers is uh, sponsoring. I had no idea. All I knew is fourth grade, fifth grade, and my sixth grade. So back then, you stayed in elementary school at sixth grade in New York City. You know, most of us went to, in middle school, you did seventh, eighth, and ninth. You had the option, the option to do ninth grade at your middle school, or you could go to high school as a ninth grade freshman. You had those options. So, so by sixth grade, I developed a relationship, a close relationship with him. A close relationship with him because I was his best player. Uh, no matter what school we went to, they can have five or six kids that, uh, that is good, but he knew that I can count on me to, to do what I do. <laughs> and I, uh, uh, even in summertime, he'll, he will see me playing somewhere and, and, and drive by and check on me. So I had no idea he was refereeing until the, the, the unfortunate day it happened to him that he was refereeing one of those big time tournaments and got into a situation that, that they didn't, a few people didn't like the call and he ended up dying out there. How did he get killed? I want to say he got punched. He it wasn't a it wasn't a, he didn't get shot anything like that. It was a, a a punch. I think the punch was to the to the temple side, the temple of his head, and uh, he went down. That was it. Yeah, I mean, how did you take that? Here you are. This is the guy that's really kind of changing your life and kind of setting you up for your next chapter, and then. Suddenly, he's gone. It was the first of many uh, uh, deaths of people that are close to me. It was the first time I was young. It was the first of many that you know. It was the first that I had to you know deal with COVID because now I had to go come to school, and you go to school. So this happened actually to him. It happened when I was in the, in the summer of my fifth grade year. So when I come back to school in my sixth grade year. He's not there, and, and 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 you know, it's somebody you, it's somebody we leaned on. It's somebody if I if I was in school in, as well as other kids, it's somebody that uh, you go talk to when things aren't you know when things aren't going where you're at home, when you feel some kind of way, when you feel down about situations in, at home or something's going on outside in the neighborhood, you it's somebody you can talk to because he's well well aware. He's he's familiar with you know everything that surrounds that neighborhood. Well, I mean, being in that type of environment, and that was just one of the side effects of being in that environment. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people, you got a lot of hustlers out there betting on the games and they feel that ref just messed up their $10,000. Yeah, they're they're yeah. going to feel some type of way at that ref. Oh, no. It, <laughs> it, 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 listen, it, and it probably was more money than that. You know, mm. If you go back in that era with the, 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 the players that was involved with the betting, it was a lot more than 10,000. 10, might have been in the first quarter. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, everything is, it, it's, it's like, it's crazy with that environment because it's like you graduate in every level of that environment. You know, you, you're, 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 you're first a kid, you're, you're, okay, I live in a tough neighborhood, you know, not to hang around this part, not to stand on this corner because such this is going on in that corner. You know, to go over here, hang out with your friends out here, you know, to go to the park or do that. And then when you get it, you keep getting old and you keep each year, it's like you're graduating, not just from school, you graduating from the other school of hard knocks. Uh, yeah. in, even if you're not involved, you're graduating with your eyes and your mind. I mean, at that time, there's literally millions of dollars in the street. Yeah, could be out right and, there outside. Yeah. Yeah. Just millions of dollars in the street. Whoever wants to join up, there's always a job for them. Carry this, look out there, yeah. sell this, you know, and here you are broke, 
you know, living in a house with a bunch, you know, one bedroom house with all your siblings and your mom. Was there ever, okay, I'm just going to do this a little bit and jump in and out or, you know, or I, I'm just going to dabble in this a little bit or was basketball just tunnel vision? So basketball was always the thing, you know, my, my heroes, my, so my heroes are the ones I could, that are on TV, right? So at this time, you got guys like Mark Jackson, Pearl Washington, Rod Strickland, you got Kenny Smith, you got all these New York City guys that because I'm playing ball and, and with these, these different coaches are telling me about uh, a local guy that went to DePaul, Kenny Patterson, all these guys that are on TV. So, I, you know, I, my love affair with basketball was always there. So I'm, I always want to be those guys. You see what I'm saying? Because, you know, that's, I want to, every day I touch a ball, I want to, I want to be on TV. I want to go to this college. I want to make it to the pros. I want to be these guys. But the unfortunate part about growing up in these environments in the inner city is that the ones that also become your idols and people that are these hustlers. Because why? As soon as you come outside, you see them every day, all day. You see them. You realize, and now as you keep getting older, now you're 12, you're 13, you realize, oh, I live in this one bedroom apartment, roaches, mice, whatever, right? And you come outside, you see these guys with the flashy cars, all the women like them, all the jewelry, right? Uh, having a, you, to you, they're having the time of their lives and, and everything is hunky dory. And you want to be like them. You want what they have. You tired of, living the way you live. The scary part about it is you're only 13 and this is 12 and 13. And this is how you feel already. And yes, it, 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 yes, it, not just myself, even my peers. That's what we wanted to do. And that's what we decided that we we thought we had, that's what we had, we needed to do to, uh, so we could look good going to school. So we could, we don't have to want or, or, or beg and ask your parent, your mom, and you already know the answer if you ask her. <laughs> so, yes, we decide, you know, this is what we want to do. This is what we're going to indulge in. You know, um, uh, unfortunately for them and for me is I always had a safety to run back to. And that was that basketball. You know, that was that basketball. And I always was able to run back to that uh, whenever need be. Okay, so eventually you went to high school, uh, Benjamin and Cardoza? Yeah, yeah. Cardoza H High School. You go to high school and you have a very well-known coach, Ron DeClario. Mm -hmm. And he was almost like one of the main guys that would be spotting new talent. What was that experience like once you got to that level? So my high school coach, Ron DeClario, I met him in junior high school. So the junior high school where I went, so junior high school eight, it was called it's Richard S. Grossley. It's called IS Intermediate School Eight. We call in the neighborhood we call it IS Eight. So uh, when I went to that school, the talent that was in that school was unreal. It was unreal. It was so many of us from the neighborhoods. We all knew each other, knew of each other, and the talent was incredible. Like. Practice or tryouts was, it was a war in there because we all could play, we all was good. So he would always come to our school, even before I got there, to get that, to get the recruit, to get the kids to come all the way to Benjamin Cardoza High School. What the, the problem was is Benjamin Cardoza High School is in a predominantly white suburban neighborhood. We all come from low income, impoverished, neighborhood in South Side Jamaica, Queens. And uh, not many of them, many of us adapt well, you know, the commute, we got to take two buses, and, you know. So a lot of us don't adapt well in that area. Not, not, not that we had any racial tension, it's just that the com our comfort zone, we, a lot of us are comfort, com comfortable in the environment. For me, meeting him and everything was wonderful. It, it, you know, I knew he, he, you know, he came and got a couple of kids that were older than me from my neighborhood. You could, uh, a guy by the name of Raheem Oates, Gary Rush. They were going to the school, right? They were juniors and seniors. So, coach, I can lean on those guys to go to that school. You know, they, they tell me all about the school, all about coach, how wacky, how crazy he is. He's yelling and screaming and kicking things, throwing chairs and everything. So, 
But, you know, we come from an environment that, that didn't bother us. Like, we seen the worst. <laughs> and uh, he knew my talent was there. He knew how good I, I was at the time. He knew how good I can be. And he always was on my back about, you know, doing the right thing, staying out of trouble, uh, and, and just, you know, just, you know, keep working on my game. And he's he's another one that, uh, Coach Clara's always another one. He's another one that, you know, from the time they laid eyes on me, uh, it was I was one of those guys to them in their eyes that this could be the next kid that uh, – makes it out this neighborhood. Well, he ended up actually recording you on VHS tapes, and he sent those tapes to And One. Yeah, he's one of the guys. <laughs> okay, and and this was while you were still in high school or, or afterwards? Some of it was when I was in high school. Okay. Some of the footage is when I was in high school. It was like my junior, summertime of my junior year, and then it's the summer of my senior year. Okay, because... You ended up graduating, and then you went to Ventura College in California? Well, I never even, I didn't graduate. Oh, nah. okay. So, 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 so when what I happened? Went, so when I went to the Cardoza High School, um, my first two years, I was played, I played. My first year I played, um, him and I were getting back for because I, I, I felt I was one of the best guys. I was better than a senior at the time, but he felt I was... Small, I was thin. I needed to learn, which was okay, cool. But then in my sophomore year, I was the man of the team. I was averaging 25 points per game. I played the whole year. We lost in the playoffs. It was my junior year and see, my junior year, that's when I started being more of a truant. I wasn't going to every class. Some days I wouldn't, some for days I wouldn't even show up to school. Um, I was caught up in into, with how my home life was going. Then I was caught up hanging out all night with my friends in my neighborhood. So I missed out a lot of my junior and senior years. So uh, it forced me to bounce to different schools, a uh, different high school. I mean, I even went to a school, a prep school in Longburg, North Carolina. So I ended up going way out there to try to salvage my high school. But then I ended up, it was, Longburg like a country town, like it chickens running across the road and I'm a city kid. So there's a lot of things I like. So. I had my mother and some people send me some money through the Western Union. And the Western Union was in the Greyhound bus station. I took the money from one thing, went to the other line and got my bus ticket and went, got on the bus and came on home by myself. <laughs> so my mother, I'm knocking yeah. on the door. She's like, who is It's me. She's going crazy. What are you doing here? You're supposed to be at school. I said, I can't deal with that country stuff. So I end up, so I end up getting my, coming back to New York, get my GD and going to Ventura Junior College. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, right. Because then you went to Fresno City College, then Fresno State University. Right, exactly. I, I mean, someone at your skill level, and, and here you are sort of near the end of your kind of school, you know, basketball journey. You're right there at the point of potentially being drafted to a major university and really going to that next level and going straight to the NBA draft after maybe even a year or two. What What caused you to kind of drop the ball near the end there and then ha having to end up going to some of these, you know, not top-notch schools at that point. Well, my grades were bad. So mm. those schools back off you. So throughout my, throughout my travels in high school, I played AAU ball and I, I would, no matter where, I was playing at Riverside Church and, and uh, no matter where they took me, I, I would I'd show up and show out. You know, I, I, they, they took me to uh, Lubbock, Texas. We had an AAU tournament at that time. It was, called, it was called the BCI. And we played against some of the top-notch basketball players, guys like Antoine Walker was in that, that tournament, Chauncey Bill. A lot of these different guys, Samaki Walker, these are names of guys that played in the NBA even when I got there. All right, so we all around the same age. We're playing this AAU tournament, and I'm, I'm doing my thing. They take me to Virginia to a Boo Williams tournament, and... Uh, we, I run into, I play against Allen Iverson, uh, Tony Rutland, and I'm I'm doing my thing as well. As, even though they're doing their thing, I'm doing my thing as well. So the talent was always there. People knew how good I was. The grades wasn't there. So now I'm forced to go to JUCO, and I'm like, okay, now I have to buckle down and take care of the bit. And I never the school was never the problem. It's not. I never had a. I don't have a learning disability. I could comprehend. I could pick. I majored in psychology, so you know, I didn't. I took. I took on the, the challenges of school when in, in college. It's just in high school attending. You know, staying away from what my friends in the neighborhood were doing, and 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 and, and do what the kids in the school were doing. That was my issue in high school. So 
I didn't have the grades to go to those big time schools, so there was no reason for them to recruit me. So when I when I when I went to junior college, you know, everything worked out. I mean, I was doing what I needed to do on the uh, in the classroom and uh, on the court. And those same schools were coming; they were coming back around once they realized that where I was at, and I was a JUCO All American. There you have it. Okay, so did you actually graduate from college? No, I left after my junior year, and then I end up take doing my classes uh, online and picking up my degree that way. So, uh-huh. so, but I left after my junior year, and I played in the NBA for so long that I had to go back online and do those classes. Okay, so at what point did you join the N One Tour? Hmm, I, I don't know exact year. When I joined the N One Tour, I want to say it was. Uh, I don't know if it's 99 or 2000. I want to say 2000. It could be, give or take. So I want to say, I, don't, I, I want to say it was 2000. If I'm off by, I can only be off by either 99 or 2001. But let's say, let's say about 2000, I joined the AM1 tour. And um, the AM1 team at that time consists of guys I played with or against uh, in Rucker Park or different tournaments throughout New York City, with the exception of maybe one or two or three players that they that they picked up along the way on the tour, you know. So what what they used to do is go to every city and have an open run a couple of days before the actual game that we were going to have in that city. And if the open run, if we if we come to L.A. and we have open run and we like one or two guys, we'll put them on the tour. We'll put them. They'll join the tour with us. And you know, so I, I ended up joining the tour. That's that's some. Um, I want to say two thousand. Okay. And the the skip to my Lou name did that come from the N one tour? Or no, did you have that skip to my Lou. I got skip to my Lou when I was fifteen years old in the in Rucker uh-huh. in Rucker Park. Aha, uh-huh. yeah. So okay. I got fit. So and that- I my high school coach Ron Clara took me out to Rucker Park when I was fourteen, and he put me on the team. And he like I so these are grown men. These are like high school Americans, college, and some guys playing overseas. So I'm like, there's no way I'm gonna get them playing time with these guys. These guys are phenomenal. You know, these guys I've, I've watched in, in the, during their high school uh, days, some of these guys in college, I watched them on TV. So one day, um, he, he, we have a game, he takes me up there. I'm, um, actually, I meet him up there. <laughs> and, and we only have like seven guys. So now I'm like, oh snap, I gotta play today. And when I went in that game, man, I had no fear. I'm just weaving through the weaving through the defense, throwing passes, and I'm the crowd is getting off their feet, and I'm like, uh oh, I'm, I'm doing something out here with all these with these grown ups, this you know, you know, because this is like a pro am league. This is the this is the creme de la creme of summer summer Thomas in New York City, and they was calling me the Energizer. They were, so the the guy in the mic, the they were Tango, his name was Tango, Duke Tango, and Al Cash. They 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 were doing the play by play on the microphone. And they was like, uh-oh, here comes the Energizer, because he keeps going, he keeps going. So I'm like, oh, snap, they gave me a nickname. So I, I come back the next time, and everybody's like, man, we want to see the Energizer get in. And, you know, and so now all these guys are back from wherever they were at playing. Now, now the team is back. Not, it's not seven of us. It's, it's full. And now the people are like, man, we want to see the Energizer. So now the only time I was going to get in is so we up by 20. It was down big. So they'll put me in. I do my thing. The very next summer, I'm 15. It's all about me now. These guys are nowhere to be around. So now I'm there every day. And one day I just, it was a, the other team was shooting a free throw. And I was like, well, what could I do to get these people off their feet again? What, what could I do? And I thought of something right on the spot. I said, if I get on the two on one, three on one fast break, I'm saying this in my summer head, I'm going to let the ball bounce beside me. I'm going to start skipping and I'm going to see if this guy go for that ball. And if he go for that ball, I'm going to wrap that thing around and throw a no look to my teammate for the finish. And it just happened true to form. It just happened the way I just thought about it right there on the spot. I got the outlet, pushed the ball to the middle court. I got two guys filling the lane, and the one defender's back there's three and one. I just start skipping, and he went for the ball. I threw it to my team, and he caught it in stride and just dunked it. Boom! And everybody just ran the floor on the court. And the guy Al Cash do test like, ladies and gentlemen, we have a whole new nickname for him. We get that skip to my loop. That's the skipper. And that and everybody's on the court. They like grabbing me. I'm like, I don't. I just did a regular. I thought it was a silly, dumb move. I just did. I thought. I thought of something to get him to go. Yeah, you know, you know, get the crowd roaring. 
I had no idea that this nickname was going to be my name for the rest of my life. And this is going to be so legendary. And, and this was going to carry me through my journey in basketball, man. But it was phenomenal. It was some phenomenal times. So I ended up playing Rucker 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. A couple of times when I was playing the NBA. And I just stopped. I forgot what point I just stopped playing. And but till this day, man, Skip to my little is my nickname. And a lot of people don't even know my real name. They know me as Skip. <laughs> they think my mother named me Skip. <laughs> <laughs> there you have it. Okay. so. So you're doing the and one mixtape tournament and you're basically going city to city and humiliating whoever the locals are. Right, <laughs> right, that right. I mean, was there ever like, I mean, I mean, you're, you're hurting sp- people's feelings in the process. You know, these guys probably were the shit in their city until right. you guys showed up and, and just destroyed them. I mean, was there ever any fights, any bad feelings, shootings, anything of that sort? No, nah, you know what? It's but at this point, when the N one tour was coming to these people's city, and you're right, some of these guys that was in that park, that's their park. Like they the man in them park. They already right. know what's to come. They already know what's coming when we get there. So it's to be expected. You know what I'm saying? So if we if somebody come down and shake and hit you with the head with the ball, you already know that was coming because you know that's what we were coming to do. Um I I think what surprised what really got under people's skin, but it still wasn't no fights and nothing like that, is that they didn't realize that a lot of us, um, a lot of the other guys that were on the tour that had these nicknames and stuff, they didn't realize how that they could play some real legit basketball. They thought it was just all f- tricks and all this stuff, put it under your shirt, roll on the ground, wrap it around your head, hit you in the head. They thought it was all that until you know, a couple of, there was a couple of cities we went to like Chicago, Philly, different play we went to. And they were like, well, let's play a real game. And then we, when we gave them a real game, they were shocked that, oh, they can, they really can get down out here. You know, because there's a quite a few of the guys that are on that and one tour. A lot of them played college ball. Well, they were the man in their high school teams. <laughs> you know, some of us are like one of my guy, um, he's from California. His name is Sick With It on the and one tour. His name is Sick With It. He's from Pasadena. Him and I played against each other when I went to Ventura Junior College. We ended up linking, linking back up some way somehow on the and one tour but no one knew that him and i were one of the top guards in california junior college and, and him and i actually my junior college we beat his team to go to the state finals we beat i beat his we beat his team uh, and him and i both were being recruited high we were both being recruited by jerry Tarkanian to come to go to uh, fresno state okay then in 1998 the nba came calling now up to that point, was the NBA like a serious goal or was it just like, okay, I'm playing street ball, I'm doing this and one thing and the NBA is just a distant memory? No, so through, through, through my whole travels, the NBA was always the goal. From the time I was introduced to basketball, I'm in those playgrounds by myself. Um, imagine myself being Dr. J, I imagine myself being Isaiah Thomas, I I'm, I'm imagine myself being Larry Bird. Right? Uh, Magic Johnson, all these guys. You know, I wore 11 my whole life because I wanted to be Isaiah Thomas. So the NBA was always my thing. I always knew how to play the game of basketball the right way. The street ball stuff was just, that's just what, what we do in New York City because all the Thomas and was out in the park. In the summertime, most of the Thomas in the playground. It wasn't until I went to other cities and states and I see that most of their Thomas is inside indoors, even in the summertime. You know what I'm saying? But in New York City, even as little kids, your tournament is considered a playground street ball game because it's out because it's just it's outside the park. So, but my whole time, I, I, all I want to do is make it to the NBA, right? Uh, all my coaches I had since I was a kid, they knew that's where I was. I belong. They knew I was. I had the talent and skill set to make it there. It was just doing the right thing in the classroom. 1998, uh, I didn't have the best year as team as a team at Fresno State. We didn't have the best year, but. You know, I averaged double digit points, 11 points, I averaged seven assists, seven and a half assists. So from a point guard standpoint, that's pretty solid by college standpoint. You know, most of the time a point guard might average a lot of points or they, they probably average four assists or they might average 12 or 13 points. They average about seven, eight assists. So I was right there on the cusp of a, a solid to good point guard that should be reckon, recognized by NBA uh, scouts. Um, um, I went to Chicago pre-draft camp, like all the kids still do today, <laughs> and uh, I turned it out. I turned it out. I mean, I mean, it was some of the best guards, some of the best players that would obviously played that obviously played in the NBA that was drafted that year or 
probably caught on the NBA team if they weren't drafted. They was they were in the NBA. Uh, right when I got drafted, the 39th pick to uh, the Milwaukee Bucks in 1998. Right. You're in the second round. Yeah. So how did it feel at that point to really be working towards this your entire life from five years old and then they announced that you're getting drafted by the Milwaukee Bucks? It was a dream come true. I was in L.A. I was in Marina Del Rey at some bar. It's just I wanted to be by myself. So I was... Uh, uh, I, was just, I was having a cheeseburger, a Coca-Cola, and I'm sitting at the bar. The first round goes by. Now remember, I declared, I declared a draft as a junior. The first round goes by, and I'm sitting there like, uh-oh. I, I might have made the biggest mistake. So the first round goes by, I'm thinking, okay, plan B. I can either go to the CBA, because the, they had the CBA then. There was no G League, that CBA, or you go overseas. I'm thinking. They had cut away to commercial. During the, after the first couple of picks of the second round, they come back and they say, while we were, while we were away, the Milwaukee bus took, took Ray for Austin. And I just yell in the restaurant. I'm like, hell yeah. Hell yeah. So now you got all these people now. You familiar with California. You know Marina Del Rey. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, these people right. looking at me like, what the hell is wrong with him? They think I'm high. They think, I'm like, they're like, what is wrong with him? So I turn and uh, see the people looking at me. I said, oh, y'all not even looking at the TV. You don't even understand. So as a person to the right of me, you could see they were getting irritated. So I had like maybe like 140 bucks. I said, look, I'm gonna pay for mine. I'm gonna pay for uh, his his too, because I, I I see I just messed his day up by yelling in his ear. So I had paid for the guy's food, and he's like, I mean, thank you. He didn't, he didn't have. It. I'm like, don't worry about it. So I run out. I had a rental car. I run out to the rental car, go back to the uh, hotel, and I'm just like, yeah, yeah. And I call my friend Eddie Loud. I'm saying, yo, man, this this has happened, you know. Uh, so then the Bucks call me. Obviously, you know when they draft you, a representative of the Bucks, they call you, man. And you know, and that's how it all. That's how my draft day went. <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't like I was sitting in with my family. I was sitting. Oh, I was at the draft in the green room. And I mind you, the draft is in New York City. I'm from New York City, so I should have been there. It, even if I wasn't going to be a first round pick, I still should have been in New York with my family. But you know, when you make those type of decisions, you come to the decision to leave a, a early, and you're not sure. If you made the right move, you know, I just wanted to be by myself, you know, and uh, if it didn't go right, I could think, put, get my thoughts together. And, but if it, it, it went well, man, I was happy to be. It's a dream come true to get your name called. Everything flashes before you when they call your name. Uh, the whole travel, all the ups and downs in your basketball journey, your life, even though you're still young. You know, I was 21, about to turn 22 that summer. Uh, Everything just flat and full. He's like, man, it, it all it all worked, right? So everything comes to fruition. But at that time, I knew I still had so much work to do because at that time, second round picks they weren't giving you guaranteed money. At that time, second round picks the salary was like two hundred twenty some thousand, two hundred thirty six thousand dollars, something like that. I think my first contract was like two hundred thirty six thousand. So at those times, you're like, you gotta make the team. Uh, so that's what happened. So I had to re, as I'm jumping for joy, I had to bring it back down, realize, hey, you got to go in there and, and, do, and do what you need to do. Right. And you became the first street ball player to actually go to the NBA. And, you know, we were talking before the cameras turned on, you know, we were talking about, for example, Pee Wee Kirkland, who I interviewed yeah. a while back. Yeah. Like he was good enough to go to the NBA from street ball, but he was making too much drug money at the time to really bother. Right, right. And, and, and so to, uh, growing up, they all told, they told, told me about the Pee Wee Kirklands, the Joe Hammonds, the Earl Manny Goats, because I come to learn about them, one, not just by playing in Rucker Park. I learned, come to know of them because I was heading down that path. You know, I wasn't in the, in the game, the, the street game, heavy as Pee Wee was, 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 was nowhere near that. But by not taking care of my business in high school, the, the, the basketball world in New York City was starting to let me know, hey, you're going to end up like your basketball career is going to end up being like this. The woulda, coulda, shoulda been. Even though for us in New York City, we still glorify their basketball career. Because if you talk to me about Pee Wee Kirkman, you, I'm like, man, I was a, they, they said he was a bad boy. So I'm going to look up to him regardless because he, he was bad with that, with that basketball. Throughout my, throughout my time in uh, Rucker Park, I always see Joe, Joe Hammond, and I always give him a hug. Joe, come give me a hug because 
playground legends, respect playground legends. And um, again, I grew up in environments to understand what they were going through. Uh, but, you know, like I said, Pee Wee had to, he had a chance. They offered him a contract to go in there. But, you know, making that kind of money out there, he's making way more money than the guys that's playing in the NBA. So at that time, I can only imagine this, the the decision to say, nah, I'm, I don't want that contract. I can only imagine. It, 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 at that time to him, and it wasn't worth it. Probably to him, the money, the money value was worth it. The game was worth it to, the, to play against some of the best players in the league. He probably understood that, you know. Um, I'm sure he told you that that playing against those guys was worth was going to be worth it. But to play against them and to make that type of money, and I can make that money in two hours. <laughs> I I can only imagine the thought process. Well, you joined Milwaukee. Yeah, and you were there from '99 to to 2002. Yep. Yes, sir. But that wasn't really the greatest experience for you. It. You know what? When I look back, it was a good experience. What that did, because I, even though I wasn't playing, I, was, I wasn't getting the minutes. You know, I played for a good coach, George Call, a phenomenal coach. But he wasn't it, it, playing the young veteran, young a young player wasn't really his thing, uh, uh, unless you fit a certain position and criteria for his team you know but it you know in that nba at the you know it's tough playing young player because one even though we can play we haven't learned how to win in that league so but at that time i don't know that i don't know that's why he's not playing i don't know that unless you go in there you know talk to the coach but the, the greatest thing i got from those three years is that i was able to be around some phenomenal players some phenomenal men that was able to teach me about being a pro they was able to show me what it was to be a pro, how to win. So by time, just, it was only a couple of years later, maybe two, that I became a starter. I was playing 33, 34 minutes at night. And I was able to help a team get to the playoffs, win a playoff series. Then a couple of years later, I was going to another team. I'm helping them get to the playoffs. I'm helping them win 55 plus games in a season. So, and I'm not able to do that if I don't take what I learned those three years, even though I'm sitting on the pond, uh, for the first time in your life, you're you're not the man, you're not the starter, you know. It's, people don't understand. That's it's hard to deal with. But I, I had the right group of guys around me: Sam Cassell, Ray Allen, Glenn Robinson, uh, Vinny Del Negro, Danny Manning. I had some of the greatest. I mean, these are guys that when I was a kid watching TV, I'm watching these guys on television at at, at their respective colleges. Well, then by 2002, you get traded to the Raptors. Actually, so my contract ends with the bus in 2002. No one picks me up, right? So actually, I went to training camp with Golden State, and they released me, right? They released me. I, in the training camp, I was probably one or two of the uh, top point guards they had in the camp. The other point guard in the camp was uh, Gibbard Arenas, right? So there was no other point guard in camp. Right, so you know, you would think, okay, no matter what, when I was at camp with Golden State Warriors, I'm like, shit, they gonna keep at least, they gonna keep me at least to be a backup. But they were trying to make Bobby Sura a point guard. You know, what I'm saying Bobby Sura is really a he played most of his life and career as a shooting guard. They released me, so that's when I started to learn all oh, the politics and what goes into the NBA. Like, it, guys may have agents, the agents might be cool with the coaching staff or the general manager. So they're going to keep their play. That's when I first got a wind of, okay, this is what really goes on. It's not that they released because I wasn't good enough. It would be because they were going to keep certain guys because uh, for certain agents and certain people. So, which is cool. It didn't bother me at all because I knew it wasn't my skill set. I go back to New York City, Vlad, and no one, the phones wasn't ringing. My age at the time was telling me, man, you, you, should, you should go. So now they just started. The, it was called the D League then. So they just started this, the NBA developmentally, the D League. So they were like, man, so my age like, you want to go to the D League? I'm like, I'm not going down there. I'm going to destroy them kids. I just played three years in the NBA. I'm playing against, I'm not, I'm not going down there. So he's like, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. I'm going to take some time. So I'm in New York City just hanging out with friends, partying every night, and, you know. And it was one day, man, I got up, God bless his soul. Mark Jackson's brother was one of my close friends uh, on my M1 team, Big Escalade, Troy Jackson. We were riding to his house, and he was saying, yo, man, you got to stop. You got to get back and go. You got to play. And two days later, 
I end up going, my agent ended up having me go down to Mobile, Alabama. I was with the Mobile Revelers of the D-League. And, and as soon as I arrived, right off the plane, I hit the ground running. I just started, I went right to work on those kids down there. And I got called up to the Toronto Raptors on a 10-day contract. The 10 days, I'm kicking butt in the NBA. I'm, I think I'm averaging like 20 points or 17 points a game in my 10-day. And so in the NBA at the time, you, they, before they could sign you to the rest of the year, they got to... You got to sign another 10 day. So it's like you get a chance at two 10 day contracts. They signed me to a 10 day, another, a second 10 day. Uh, my coach at the time was a great New York City guard from Brooklyn, uh, Lenny Wilkins. And then, so one day I'm getting ready, I'm, I'm putting my shoes on for practice. I'm, I'm tying my shoes up, getting ready for practice. He comes by, he says, he said, Can you have anybody else go get the rest of your stuff? You know what I mean? The rest of your clothes and stuff you need for you. I said, Why, wow, Cole? He said, We're going to keep you for the rest of the year. And I mean, so I said, thank you, man. And then it meant a lot because he's an icon in Brooklyn, Lenny Wilkins. Like, he's like one of the greatest point guards to ever play. He's also one of the greatest coaches to ever coach the game. And for him to keep me, it meant a lot. And, and, and so from that point on, my career took off from there. It was, it was, it was getting the, the 10 day contract, getting put in a situation where the coach, gave me the ball to run his team and run the organization. My career took off from 2000, 2002, 2003. My career took off. You played with the Raptors, and then you ended up joining the Miami yeah. Heat. Yeah, yep. There you go. And Dwayne Wade was a, was a rookie yeah. at that point? he's a rookie, a rookie phenom. Okay. What was it like to play with Wade it is, at the very start? So I knew of Wade because he went to Marquette, and I was with the Bucks while he was in college. And so I saw his growth. I remember him having to sit out. I remember D Dwayne Wade, I remember he had to sit out a year. And then uh, I had went by Marquette University one summer and they were playing pickup and I watched him. Uh, I'm like, damn, this kid has talent, uh, but you know, something's missing, but he, he has talent. I think what was missing at the time is that I, you know, I didn't, I couldn't tell what position he really was. He wasn't a two guard, he wasn't a point guard. He just didn't know, but he was a phenomenal athlete. And then lo and behold, we ended, uh, the Heat end up drafting them. I end up signing with the Heat late summer. And I'm like, wow, I'm on the, I'm on the team with a kid I was watching and playing pickup, sitting out in Marquette. And then I watched him, you know, play and get lead, lead Marquette to the Final Four. So I knew, I knew he was a phenomenal ball player. just didn't know what position he was going to play. The key to that year for me was playing with a guy that was from my neighborhood that is a few years younger than me. I watched him come up in the high school ranks. He was a, a legend in the neighborhood. It was Lamar Odom. Uh, so I got a chance to play with a guy who, unbeknownst to me, looked up to me because I'm older than him because I was a skip to my Lou. Everybody was talking about skip to my Lou in New York City. So unbeknownst to me, until he said it in his book not too long ago, he wrote a book. He said, man, how much, you know, he looked up to skip to my Lou because I was from the same neighborhood. We were from, we, we were from the same area in South South Jamaica, Queens. And we're on the same team. But what happened was I was on a one year contract that I couldn't even enjoy hanging out with him playing with him as much as I wanted to enjoy because I had to try to get me a long-term deal. You know, it's, it's hard to be on a one-year contract and try to enjoy life with, you, with a, a guy from your neighborhood, you know, and, and, and everything. So that was the best thing about the 2003-2004 season was playing with Lamar Odom as well as, as was playing with Dwayne Wade and playing with the Miami Heat. The very next year, 2004-2005, I signed a six-year contract with the Toronto Raptors. And that's what I was playing with Chris Bosh, Jalen Rose, uh, and those guys. Okay. And when you signed with the Raptors, that was your first real serious basketball deal. Yeah. My uh, one and only. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Can you say how big that deal was? It was six year, twenty seven million, but incentives. So it was really a six year thirty million dollar deal. Mm. So six year thirty million dollar deal. I mean, how so did that it feel? so compared to now, that's that's peanuts. Yeah, compared but to back that. then. Yeah, yeah. Back then, it was a serious deal. I mean, how no, did no, it it's, feel? It's put it like this: you like, know? it's serious coming from Southside Jamaica Queens. So, right, like, I'm making probably I'm making my one year. I'm making more money than probably the entire neighborhood. You know? Yeah, yeah. Even the guys you Listen. looked up to, even the hustlers you looked up to, one yeah. year I'm making. <laughs> exactly. So, so now you have this six year deal with the Raptors, and. You know, basically everything you've been working up to your whole life has now been materialized. Yes. 
You know, you're now in, you know, you, I mean, you got to the NBA, but then you were struggling for all those years. And now, boom, after that strong year with, with Miami, now you have a real right. extended right. contract with a major NBA team. Right, right. Okay. And Jalen Rose was on that team. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And you did an interview with, with Queens Flip. Right, right. And you talked about Jalen Rose. You said, him and I didn't get along. I love Jalen Rose as a man. But he's a terrible teammate. So, and, and I did the interview with Jalen, and Jalen understood the part that I let me. Ref, I, I would love to, so people can understand. Mm-hmm. It's not that he was a terrible teammate one way. You see what I'm saying? We, I was a terrible teammate to him as well. We were terrible teammates to each other. His right, but I love Jalen Rose. I love him as a man. I love his game. Jane Rose has game. Uh, we love, I love Jane Rose just like a lot of other people love Jane Rose and the Fab Five. So we love Jane Rose way, but I love Jane Rose before <laughs> I even became his teammate. Right? The problem was, and the, the gripe I only had with him from a basketball standpoint, because again, like I told people with, on Queen's Flip, there's no gripe with him as men. If I see Jane Rose right now, he gonna run to me, hug me. I'm gonna go up to him and hug him. We, we gonna actually tell you what you're doing, what are you doing later? Let's catch up. Like that's that's who we are. It was just we did, we had a difference in our basketball approach. Um, the reason I have a hard on for him, I, I have a hard out for him for his basketball foot because when I signed there, the first person I saw when they brought me in there to do my interview when I signed the contract was Jalen Rose. I saw him in the hotel, and I told I knew then. I talked to him. He talked to me. I. I we, I thought him and I had an understanding that though if anything was to go wrong, because this is a guy that played in the NBA Finals, this is a guy that uh, was with the Pacers, he was a leading scorer of the Pacers when they had Reggie Miller, Mark Jackson, and they were doing their thing. So he know, understand. So I thought this is a guy I can lean on. You know what I'm saying? Throughout the year, that that didn't, that wasn't the case. So that's why I have an issue because the first person I ever saw when I got to uh, Toronto in, in my hotel, right before they was taking me to do my interview, was Jalen Rose. And I had a, we had a conversation. And we're both strong-minded individuals. He come from Detroit. I come to the city. So we, I thought it was a connection because we already understood each other. We understand where we come from. We understood what, what it took to get here. We understood life's journey. You see what I'm saying? So to have a person that I look up to and to have to go through this friction with him on the basketball court, that was I thought that was going to be the easiest part, was the basketball. You know it, and that's what happened. So our year was kind of rocky. You know, I ended up I, start, I, I ended up having one of my best years from a statistical standpoint. <laughs> so, you know, but our year was kind of rocky. You know, from a basketball standpoint, in which if him and I was to look back again and think about it, it should never have been. Well, he actually responded. Uh, to the interview, and he actually said, I did take no lies. If we were struggling, and I'm pretty sure based on what he said on our squad, we were, yeah, I detect no lies. Okay, one thing about Jay is, and I learned that from playing with Jalen, Jalen is going to speak the truth. Jalen's going to acknowledge the truth when he sees it, when he hears it, or he sees the truth. You know, so it, I, I caught no backlash from Jalen. Uh, from when I, from the Queens flip thing, and even if I did, I'm a person till this day. I don't, I don't, if he felt if he felt it took his way, I would call him and be like, "Yo, uh, bring me on your show," and I would if, 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 and I would apologize to him as a man in, on his show, because that's just the man I am. That's the man he is. You know what I'm saying? So, like I said, it's one of those years. If I look back at my career, it, if that would have went different, it could have we could have built something special there. You know. It, uh, that, that's the only thing I look back at that. But like I said, the main part about the whole thing with me and Jalen is that nothing could take away my feelings for him as a man. And that's the best feeling in the world. I don't care if I don't like him as a basketball player. I don't care if I don't like how he ties his shoes. I don't care if I don't like how he combs his hair. I have love and respect for him as a man. And that goes farther than what we were going through as basketball teammates. Yeah, Jalen's dope, man. I've interviewed him before. Yeah, He's, uh, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's definitely some people. A, a you know, very, so great about Jalen. Cool even on ESPN, some people sometimes just don't grasp him. Some people don't. 
They say sometimes he can go over the top, but me, I know him. He's a, to me, being, knowing Jalen, I'm like, man, he's just speaking the truth. He's speaking from his heart. He not spe- he's not making it, something up or he's not trying to sugarcoat it or, you know, beat around the bush or jump fences and hurdles. He's going to tell it, tell it the way he sees it and the way he feels. Well, you signed the six-year deal with Toronto, but then the next year you get traded to Houston. Mm-hmm. So what exactly happened? I, they, no, I showed the training camp. And but to see the, the the deal was made ahead of time. It it wasn't necessarily to that particular team. They because of that year we had, and it was like see that's the thing. Vlad, Jalen and I issue was always could be mended with Jalen and I. That year I had a problem with the coach too, and that's why. I needed to get out of there. It wasn't I need to be traded because my life said me, Jay and I, we one thing we were gonna do coming in training camp, we were gonna let the previous year let that stay where it's at. Right? Cause that's play, that's what we gotta do. We, let's move on, man. It, it happened last year, this year. We already knew coming to training camp, look, we're gonna move on, man. Cause we're both good talent. We got Chris Bosch who's gonna be a superstar in this league. We we can make the playoffs and, and make some noise. We just let's just do our thing. But it was the coach, Vlad, that I was never gonna get past. I was never getting past Sam Mitchell and his utter disrespect uh, for us as men and for us as basketball players. And, you know, one time he came in the locker room and he called us bitches. Whoa. Right? The next time, another game, he's in the locker room after the game talking about why, why players shouldn't, why we, why, or what women we have in our rooms or when we go out and stuff like that. So his utter disrespect for us as men, human beings, and basketball players, that when I once, and, and, and here's about the environment that I grew up in, how it coincides with what I'm doing now. Because where I'm from and grew up and things that I had to watch and see, disrespect led to death where I'm from. I don't see people lose their life over disrespect. So now here I am a grown man. I'm looking at another grown man's eyes as he talks to him, and he just has utter disrespect. And what hurt me the most is that we're in a professional setting and it's not much we could do to him. He can tell us this and get away with it. And it's not much we can say because he's the coach, we're the player, and we got to sit there and take this, take the foot up our rear end. And I'm sitting there like, well, in my head, I'm like, well, we didn't have to grow up like that. Someone disrespect you. You gotta, as a man, you have to go to that man and let him know that, yo, listen, we not, I don't, I'm not tolerating that. But when you're in a pressure setting, it has to be done another way. Right? And then in those settings, everyone's gonna side with the coach. They don't wanna hear what the player got. They don't care about the player, the general manager, the fans, the me. No one cares that the player could be right in that situation. So that summer, after that season, with that summer, right before we're coming back to training camp, I already let it be known to the general manager, which is uh, Mr. Babcock, who's a phenomenal man. Uh, to this day, I love him, respect him for even signing me to the deal. You know, I, um, my family's life wouldn't be the same. My kids' life wouldn't be the same today if this man doesn't ink me to that six-year deal. Okay? So I'm forever indebted to uh, Rob Babcock. But unfortunately, I knew as a man, there was no way I was going back there to play for that man. The man never apologized. The man, you know what I'm saying? So it was it was no it was no way. And so they were trying to move me. I they found they traded me to the Houston Rockets, man, and I had went back to my hotel and I almost I don't I don't even know how to do a backflip. I tried to do a backflip over the bed. That's how happy I was to to play with Tracy McGrady and Yao Ming. I said, man, I'm going to a title contending team. And I can get back into my element. Cause I come from Miami Heat where I played with Pat Riley and Stan Van Gundy and things were organized and structured and it worked. We end up, they end up taking a team. Uh, we were picked to finish last in the NBA, that two down, three tell the four Miami Heat team. We were, picked, we were picked to finish dead last in the NBA. We end up going to the Eastern Conference semifinals. So we was one of the, we was the top eight teams in the league. End up finished as the top eight team in the league. You know what I'm saying? So I come from a structured situation. I go to a situation uh, next year that was, for me personally, for my stability in the NBA, it was too chaotic for me. 
You know, the coaches off the rail, the players show up. Some of the players on the team, they practice at 11, they showing up 1040. So it was a little bit different to me. The things that led to playoff winning the previous year, when I got to Toronto that year in 2000, 2004, none of that was going to lead to us winning. And we didn't make the playoffs. Well, I mean, you mentioned on the Houston Rockets, you're playing with Yao Ming, who is just, I mean, not only a basketball phenomenon, but he broke every international barrier you could possibly break when it comes to basketball becoming a global, a global sport. I mean, even to this day, uh, you know, the Houston Rockets are probably the, the biggest basketball team, you know, in terms of love when it comes to China, because Yao Ming yeah. played for the Rockets. Yeah, rightfully so, so. so. So what was that like playing? I mean, number one, and, and this guy is really, you know, if I remember there's always this picture I always look at with, with Shaq and Yao Ming. And, and Shaq looks like a regular, <laughs> you know, just a regular man next to Yao Ming. Because oh, yeah. Yao Ming is so much bigger than him. Yeah, taller. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. Taller. So, so what was that? you know, just sort of environment like playing with, with Yao Ming? It was great, man. Yao, playing with Yao Ming was one of the greatest times in my basketball life, man, from a, from a standpoint of he made you want to get better and go about your, your job the right way every day. If practice started at 11, Yao Ming's in the building at 9 working on his game, working on his footwork, working on his free throws, working on his turnaround post-up move. He's already in a full sweat. And I, so practice at 11, I always got to the gym at 10. So I was always in the gym at 10. Uh, I, I thought I was doing something. <laughs> I'm in the gym at 10. I'm like, man, I'm doing my thing. I'm coming early. I'm get. I'm working hard. I'm working on my body. I'm working on my jump shot. Yao's already in there in a full sweat. Yao's doing his thing. And so when you see that from a, a guy, uh, all-star, perennial all-star, he's one of the best big men in the league at the time. Uh, he has to play year round because when he leaves the NBA, he has to go back play with the Chinese national team and everything. Uh, his dedication, his dedication to the sport, to the game, to his team, was was unlike any other, and it it made me want to do it every single day. And uh, I played for Jeff Van Gundy when I was with the Rock, and I played for Rick Allen, and both of them could tell you that I w- I was always there on time. I practice every day. I practice hard every day because that was who I was anyway. But I have to credit getting traded and watching Yao every day to make sure I continue to do the same, the right thing at all times. And yet, Yao was a, he's a phenomenal individual. I'm telling you, uh, yeah. not everyone get a chance to see him outside of the arena and everything, but us as teammates, man, just to sometimes just to have conversations with him and talk with him. Yao's a good guy, funny guy. Um, um, it's just unfortunate because he's such an iconic figure because of you, you're going to recognize him when he walks down the street that he can't enjoy, he couldn't enjoy life outside the arena like he would love to because everyone's going to come up to him and bother him. You know what I mean? I, I can walk down the street, no one, you got to do a double take, like, oh, because I'm only 6'2. So you got to, oh, oh, that's just get to my little. You could be 25 blocks down the street, like, Yao Ming's down there. You start running 20 blocks to see Yao Ming. <laughs> right. Okay, and then at one point, Ron Artest actually joined the team. Yeah, my guy. Yep, That's my guy. Yep, I've known Ron. I've known Ron for a while. I've interviewed him. He was actually he was actually going to be one of the invi- uh, one of the original investors of Vlad TV. Yeah, hey, Ron. Yeah. Uh, now keep in mind, <laughs> <laughs> and now he don't even like people calling us calling him Ron. But I knew Ron. I knew Meta World Peace. Ron Artest. I knew him when he was younger. His dad worked at the same hospital, Cola Memorial Hospital as my mom. Mm. And uh, we used to go up to the hospital, not just to visit our parents, but they used to have these juices. So Ron, Ron, Metal World Peace, he grew up in Queensbridge. I grew up in South Central Bay, Queens. So we, both situations are the same. Both areas is tough, rough. The same thing going on in there is going on in South Central Bay. So, you know, we, he grew up in the pride of, and the same story I'm about to tell he has that sometimes you didn't, we didn't have juice in the house. But what we used to do is take the train to our parents' job and get the, get a get a little uh, trash bag and throw all the grape juices that's for the for the patients, all the grape juice, the apple juice, the orange juice, the pineapple juice, the cranberry juice. We should just throw them all these little these little things that you peel at the top. 
You open the little time. They, they were for the patients and the workers in the hospital. We'll go in there and throw them all in our bag and get back on the train and go all the way home and put the juice in the refrigerator for our siblings. And we had juice at home. <laughs> and his dad worked in the same hospital, Cola Memorial Hospital. My mother worked in the same hospital. Yeah, man. Shout out to Ron. I can't really call him Meta for some reason. I just... You know what? <laughs> One day I saw him, right? This is kind of right, like right at the beginning of the state, he changed his name. And I was like, yeah, so Ron. He's like, Meta. I said, oh, you know what? Meta. Meta. I said, he, he, he checked, well, he, yeah. he, he checked me about don't call him Ron. So I gotta, I gotta remember because I know I'm gonna see him again. I, mean, I, I gotta remember calling him Meta because that's his name now. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, at one point he changed his name to Panda's Friend. I mean, like, <laughs> Hey, Ron, yeah. Ron does his own thing. I mean, right now, I guess, if you look him up on Wikipedia, his name is Meta Sanford Artest. So, I, I don't know. I don't know. He's he's going to do what he's, what he's going to yeah, do. Yeah, man. Uh, okay. Well, then in, in 2007, it seems like some problems started to happen. So, the first one was on August 5th, 2007. You were arrested in downtown Houston uh, for... Uh, assault and public intoxication. It had to do something with a parking attendant. Yeah, so 2007, I was driving my Bentley. I pu- when I pull up, I was going to a restaurant. I pull up to park the car. There's no parking attendant out there. I, I don't see the guy. Out there. So I got a reservation. So I get out, I'm trying to go and I eat. I come out, my car's going, I see the parking attendant. It was as simple as this. Hey, sir, where did y'all have my car towed to? Right? The guy thought I was a little dog. He says, man, go look on the tree. I said, so the guy's little, like five foot three dude. Now, I was in a restaurant eating Italian food, having a glass of wine. Uh, so the guy and I was going back and forth. We're going back and forth. I'm like, yeah, my man, I just need to know what my, the, this, this, you didn't tow a Honda Accord. You just had a Bentley a GT towed out the thing. I need to go get that. <laughs> I, need, I need to get this car. What? So he's giving me this this lip service. So I snaps on him. I said, "Yo, my man, tell me where the hell my you don't have my damn car towed to? If I lift your little behind up." That's what I told the man. He runs, calls police. Police pulls up. So I'm standing like, no one, no one did anything to this guy. Police pull up. Hey, man, man, we gotta give you, we gotta take you in. You making terrorist threats? I said, I did what? What are you talking about? So when I get to the police, when they take me in, I get downtown to the police station. They're like, well, we got to book you on public intoxication. I said, no one even checked to see if I was intoxicated. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? So I'm sitting there like, what are you even, what are y'all talking about? But now at this time, as I'm going back and forth with them, I'm like, you know what? How long before I get out of here? Because I don't, I don't know. You, you guys, this, to me, this is ridiculous. You, you know what I mean? There's Criminals out there really committing a real legitimate crime. And you're here talking about you got to give me something that you never even. Lo and behold, they, they let me out a few hours later and I go get my car and I just go home. And that was that was the basis of that situation. Right. Well, the guy said that, I mean, according to reports, the guy said that he spit in his face. Never. Never. I don't, I don't uh, uh, come from that environment and world. It, it, yeah. Why would I do that to a, little, a guy that I know... Listen, I wasn't trying to fight him. I didn't want to. I really just wanted to know where he told my car to. Why would I spit in his face somebody that I could literally look at him and know I, I have I have the upper hand on him? It, it's not it's not adequate because at the end of the day, if that was the case, he would have told the people that from the get, and then they would have gave me just a, 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 a charge for that, whatever that charge may be for doing that. I have no idea what charge spit in my face is, but whatever that charge, they would have took me that. They wouldn't have. They wouldn't have took me down there for public intoxication and, and assault. Okay, but then a few weeks later, there was another incident in a nightclub where a guy got his neck slashed. Mm-hmm. Tell me what happened there. To be honest, with you, Vlad, till this day, I still don't know. We were partying. I was partying with some friends of mine. Whenever I go to New York, I take some friends of mine in my neighborhood. You know, that's that's my way of catching up with them and go out. We bought a few, you know, you know how those people go out. We buy a few bottles of, of, of something to drink, right? It could be champagne or regular alcohol. We buy a few bottles. And we would we were having a good time. Okay. I go to the bathroom. I come back. I see the melee happen around my table. After the, the, it ends, I'm standing there in front of the bottles that I purchased, and I'm pouring me a drink. As I'm walking from the bathroom, I don't know who this dude is that had the melee, that got into with these people. 
it just so happened everyone comes to the table that we're at, right? I go home. I don't know nothing. I go home the next day. Police call. I actually I went to my grandmother's house. My grandmother's like police is asking. They call to me. You have to uh, come down to the station. I'm like, come down for what? So when I get there, they saying, uh, they said um, we put you in a lineup. I'm like, first of all, what did I do? I don't know what did I, what I what did I do? What did I do? Then they take me down there, and they the guy says him. They they point me out, and they try to say, hey, you slash somebody. They don't tell you. They don't tell you that we went to we went to court and we went to, to to fight the case that the guy says it wasn't him, mm. right? You know, it, this is the thing that happens to a lot of people in the world of of whatever status somebody may have. It's okay to say someone did something and they're gonna put it all in the newspaper, but the moment that person is found not guilty or that person, that same very same person comes and says, "Oh, he didn't do it." You don't hear yet, right? So in your report that you have, you don't see that part in there. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I, never went, never slashed nobody. Uh, never did anything to the guy that parking the attendant. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, in both those cases, you said that these situations are motivated by money. Yeah. So, so were there civil lawsuits well, well, around both those the, cases? I don't. Let me rephrase that. So, the I don't think the parking attendant. I'm not gonna say thing. I know the parking attendant guy wasn't motivated by money. He was just a small little guy. He was like, like five foot five or something. And you know, I'm six two, so I look like a, a giant to him. <laughs> so I don't think he he didn't know who I was or like that. So that, you know, when I said that, that's because at the time I was playing ball. The other guy, for sure, it was. Because when it all hit the fan, he was like, I just, they asked him, who, how you know, how'd you know Ray Fox? Well, I know he plays ball. So in his mind, he thought my, the people I was with did that to him. <laughs> that wasn't the case. Well, there you have it. So ultimately, all that was dropped? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it all went away. Yeah. And the unfortunate part is that you, I got to go through that. And people, like, so, you know, and then, you know, you, you're dealing in the basketball world. They don't want to hear that you didn't do it. You know what I mean? They just hear your name that is involved in that, and they think you some whacked out person. <laughs> you think you some crazy person. So until they meet you and have and really understand, like, nah, that's a that's a that's a cool guy. It's a very nice guy. Well, and then in two thousand nine, you you go to the Orlando Magic. Yeah. How's that experience? The greatest. The great. The greatest. My, my, let me go back a little. Just my time in Houston was great. I, there's some one, some wonderful teammates. T Mac is till this day is like a big brother. I'm older than him, and he's like a big brother to me. Uh, a guy I play ball with, Mike Jane. I play AAU ball sometimes with. He was on my team. Just all these guys, uh, Chuck Hayes. A lot of us that play in that Matt, that Rocket team, we're still good friends to this day. So I had the time of my life playing with Houston. Uh, we won 22 games in a row, which was unheard of. Now a couple of years later, people are doing that like it's nothing. But then I get traded to Orlando. So I go from one title contending team to another one. And these players were predominantly all veterans. Rashad Lewis, Hito Turkoglu, uh, man, Tony Batty, Anthony Johnson, Michael Petras, all these guys. Then we had some youngsters that were, you know, trying to find their niche in the league. JJ Reddick, uh, what's my other guy? Courtney Lee. Uh, so yeah, some guys, and, and you know, uh, and then I have my boy, man, he's, he's a coach now, uh, Tyron Lou. Uh, we just had some guys that they was phenomenal men that welcomed me with open arms, man. And I, I get back to play for my coach that I played for in Miami, uh, Stan Van Gundy, who, who allowed me to, 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 uh, run his team and, and, um, when he became a first year coach in Miami, uh, who believed in my ability, who gave me all the opportunity and the, all the minutes in the world to, 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 to get the six year deal with Toronto. He allowed that to happen by uh, playing me as much as he played me and doing it. So I played for Stan Van Gundy. I reunite with Stan Van Gundy, and I already know the offense. And I'm with a, another big time big man. I go from playing with Yao Ming to playing with Dwight Howard. So I know how to throw the post pad. I know how to get him the ball. I, and, and man, we end up going to the finals, man. And I've never seen the city so electrified 
as Orlando was when we were playing in the NBA. We, we, that run, that whole run from the time I got there to the NBA Finals, man, those those fans were phenomenal. That organization treated me <laughs> like I was a like I was a champion, man. Even till this day, the Orlando Magic reaches out to me and, uh, uh, and invites me to games, invites me to come, invite me to come up and, and and be a part of the Orlando Magic to this day. Well, I mean, like you mentioned, the Magic was on fire that year. Yeah. So you guys, you guys are going through the season. You guys are killing it, and then you get to the the playoffs. <laughs> uh, I, already then, know, I know where you're going. <laughs> you know where I'm going with this. You know where I'm going with this. And the Eddie, the Eddie House oh, man. slap. That the, the you know slap. what, Vlad, till this day, I'm, and I'm gonna give you a funnier story after I tell you this one. So Eddie House okay. situation, till this day, has to be one of the dumbest things I've ever did in my career. He was killing us, and then he makes a shot as I'm closing out. And I thought Eddie said something slick to me after he's about to run down the court after he makes a shot, right? So my reaction and reflex, I just, yo, man, go ahead, man. Go down the court. Right when I did it, he's in my face. Even though I'm being macho, saying something back to him, in my head, I'm like, I just effed up. I said, in my head, I'm like, oh my God. So we shower up. I, I'm coming out the locker room. He's coming out his locker room. I said, oh, here you go again. So at this time, I'm like, well, if he wants to do something, then it's going to go down. I really ain't trying to go there with him because in my head, I'm like, I know they about to hit me with a suspension. I just screwed up. He's saying something to me. I'm like, yo, Ed, go ahead, your way, Ed. Now, keep in mind, before all that, me and Eddie was cool. Hmm. One time I was playing in Milwaukee, he came, he, he, was, he came to, uh, we played against each other. We, we ended up hanging out one night out there. I'm like, yo, man, Eddie, cool, he cool. So it was the dumbest thing in the world uh, till this day. I get that. Everybody asks me about that. So I tell everybody, the dumbest, craziest thing I ever did, that was. Few years down the line, I'm coaching an AAU team in Vegas. I get to the gym early with my team. We, it's a game ahead of us. So we, we the next game on this court. This little team comes in, sits right next to us, right next to me, everything. A guy said, hey, little fella, you know who you sit next to? So I look, I look, I said, hey, what's up, man? I'm thinking he's going to tell the kid what? Hey, you sit next to Skip to my little. That's what I'm thinking. He's like, man, look at that, look at that man again. I'm like, man, how does man keep telling this little kid to keep looking at me? The guy goes, you don't know who that is? The kid goes, no. He says, that's the guy who slapped your dad. I did, I damn near jump out my seat. I'm like, no, don't tell that kid that. So I put my hand around the kid. I said, listen, man, me and your dad is cool. Your dad is a phenomenal battle player. We're cool. Make a sure so he showed up, man. The kid ended up going to Arizona State like his dad. Been playing, playing at uh Arizona State, uh, just like his dad. Because the kid become a phenomenal basketball player, man. But th that's right there, I'm like, why did this man tell this kid that <laughs> I slapped his dad? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think I think the thing about that slap, because you know, I mean, people get hit, slap, punch, whatever. But I think the optics of it, when you actually saw like the headband kind of rotate, yeah, you know, after, yeah, everybody says his headband <laughs> shifted, but then yeah, also, the headband but, actually shifted, right? But everybody, I could kill too, because Eddie Eddie came back and killed me on his little interview on Jim Rome or whatever. I forgot he went to interview. So I'm like, yo, that's what happens when you busting busting people ass. And I'm like, all right, Eddie, you got you you can have that one. You can have that one. Because no matter what, I, it's really no comeback for me anyway. Because that's how it looks anyway. So I just, I, I, I ate that one. and and But we ended up beating them in a the series. So it was, and we beat right. them in Boston. Which was unheard of to win a game seven in Boston. It's unheard of. Right. I mean, you're talking about the post-game interview where uh, he said, you know, when they asked him, you know, why do you think that, yeah. uh, that Ra the Rafer slapped you? You know, do you know why? He said, no, I just made a shot. That's what happens when you start busting someone's ass. They get upset. <laughs> just like that and resort to Bush League tactics. We above that. We're not into that. We're just going to play basketball and keep trying to put wins on the board. So that whole Bush League yeah. thing was kind of a shot at your street ball background, I feel. I don't know. I don't know. Because at the end of the day, at this point, it's my 10th year in the NBA. So... Um, how much of a street ball guy am I if I'm, I'm, in, I'm in the league 10 years? See, that, that's the thing about the... See, when I first got in the league, that's what all the scouts and a few general managers... That, that's what, Because most of the highlights of me was from and one days. 
You so, so when I first got in the league, most of my highlights that everybody could really go to is and one days. They didn't really have it. They 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 even skipped past my highlights in, in college. Right? So a lot of general managers and coaches thought, oh, he's just a street ball kid until they put me, until they gave me that basketball and asked me to run their team. Once they gave me that basketball and run their team, they couldn't, it's, they, their mouths were closed. There's not much they could say. The only thing they could say is, he's got to work on his jump shot. Which, if that was the case, 400 other players need to work on theirs too. <laughs> At that time, there's only about five, these, five dead eye shooters, right? Ray Allen being one of them, Reggie Miller being the other, right? So the rest of the rest of the league need to work on theirs too. So, but other than that, man, my time in NBA, it, you know, what they failed to realize was that I was just as good as all the other most of the guards that, you know, obviously not on some of the level as some of your perennial All Star guards. Uh, but the rest of the league, I could play with at any on any given night, any given day. Well, there was an article about this on Bleacher Report, and, and I'm not even really sure if it's true or not. But apparently, it's an interview with you about that incident in terms of why you slapped him in the back of the head. And according to this article, you said I could have sworn there was a giant insect on his headband. Or really nasty. <laughs> no, no, okay. no, I didn't say no. <laughs> <laughs> I was merely looking out for safety. Nah, that says a lot about my character. <laughs> nah. Every, hey, look, every article, every interview I did about Eddie House, man, it was always, always I made the mistake, man. I don't even, it was, it was, it was just all me. Nothing on nothing on Eddie. I just thought he I thought he was having a good night. And I thought he made the last three. I thought he was saying about the same. Cause Eddie, when he Eddie could be over 10. He make one three. He doing this with his jersey. Yeah, let's go. Like, so, you know, that's the kind of play he is. That's what that's what made him have a long career because he was so confident in his ability. Uh, so I thought when he made the shot, he said some slick. We getting our behinds kicked as a team. Cause he's really not, he's saying he's busting my behind, but I'm not guarding him. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm I'm worried about Rajon Rondo most of my most of most of the nights, most of the games, that series. So you know, he took a good shot at me, and he had every right to, but he took a good shot at me saying, oh, man, you know, that's what happens when you bust into someone's ass. I'm like, all right. I mean, he did have a he, – he had a hell of a night that night. Well, you ultimately beat him, uh, beat the Celtics. You guys go to the finals, and you end up losing to the, to the Lakers in five games. Yeah. How did it feel to finally make it to the finals and, and not win? It was, well, to make it there, it was, I was like, like a kid. It, like I said, certain, there's certain things that happens in a human being's life that are, that are make whatever you've done up until that point flash before you, right? So like I told you, me being drafted, so all the times I was playing and all to that, that just flashed before you. So when I got to the finals, I'm thinking, I was like a kid in the kids. So I'm like, man, I used to dream about this on the park. I used to, I used to be by myself, count down five, four, three, two, one. I like I hit the game winning the finals. You know, I, I used to always pretend I was Isaiah Thomas and I was winning the finals and people were picking me up, you know, like they did Isaiah in, in 1990, 89 and 90. So I'm like, wow, man, I finally is here. And I'm a starter and I'm starting in the finals. So uh, in, uh, we ended up running up against one of the greatest players to ever put on a pair of basketball shoes and play basketball in Kobe Bryant. Uh, and obviously today, let me say happy birthday. Today is Kobe Bryant's birthday. Uh, so while we're doing this interview on the day of his birthday, we say happy birthday to Kobe Bryant. Uh, he was just phenomenal, man. No matter what defense we decide to put out there on him, no matter who, two and three guys, he, it's just his will to win and to win the championship and to get it done against all circumstances, any defense was like any other. Um, and not to mention they had so much length. In that year, people underestimated their length. You know, they had Kobe at six, seven. I think the smallest guy in the lineup was Derek Fisher at 6'3". But Kobe's at 6'7". The next guy, Reeves is at 6'8". Lamar's at 6'9", 6'10". And Pau Gasol is at 7 foot 1 or whatever it was. So people underles underestimated how lengthy, how tall, you know, they were. Um, it was fun. It was, it was one of the greatest times of the being the finals. Man, the whole world's watching. Not just our country, but all the countries are watching the finals. Um, they kick our butt. First two, well, actually, we should have won one of the first two games. Cody Lee missed the layup at the buzzer to win. We'd have won that game. It, it's certain if you win one of them games at LA, it changed the dynamics of the series. All right? We go to game three, 
and Coach Van Gundy brings me in his office in early in the morning um, and asks me how am I feeling, how's my mind set, you know, and, and he just told me to go play my game. And then I ended up having 20 points in game three and uh, everyone's going crazy in Orlando. My phone's blowing up all the right, everybody from New York City's calling my phone, like, you know, like, man, you killing them. You can, and that was the only game we won. That was the only game we won. They beat us four games to one. Uh, they kicked, they kicked out behind. Well, you were primarily a starter, but then in the finals, uh, Stan Van Gundy actually replaced you with Jameer Nelson. No, no, I started every game. What he did, what Coach did was, he uh, my minutes, he brought my minutes. Down. So I was pretty much playing on an average in the playoffs and uh, up until that point, 30, 31 minutes a night, 32, give or take 32 minutes a night. And what Coach Van Gundy did, he brought my minutes down. Uh, because, but he told us, he, he, one thing about coach, man, it, it, people, a lot, I get this everywhere when they talk about the finals that, man, why coach, I said, put yourself in coach shoes and see how easy it would be for you that your all-star point guard is coming back as healthy. How, what would you do? How would you, how would you handle it? And coach did the best thing that, and for us as Jameer's teammates, huh, we wanted to see him come back, you know, cause you don't get a chance to play in the finals. This is not every year, you know, you don't get a chance to play in the finals. This is not... The Boston Celtics, when they had Kuzi and a guy that it was only 17. Yeah, you could count them in the finals, just who's going to be the other team. No, this is, you You might not get here again, in which they never got back or we never got back. I never got back. Jameer never got back to the finals again. So, but we wanted to see him play. And 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 th that was the beauty of that team and that coach and that organization is that we really cared for each other. And, and we didn't think about the rhythm it was going to break up. We didn't think about, okay, now the rhythm. We didn't care about that, man. We wanted everybody to get a piece of this in finals and play and hopefully win a ring. And, and you know, we love Jameer um, till this day, man. We, if we had to do it again, we'd do it the same way. Put him, let him play some minutes, get him, get him out there. Because he deserved it. He was carrying that team before. I, the only reason they traded for him is because they didn't think he was going to make it back from his shoulder injury. But he actually, we ended up going far enough that he actually was, was, he was, he was ready to come back. So, you know, let him come back. The only thing I could say about that was, is I would have started him. So if I ever become a coach and I was ever to do that, that happened to me, I'm going to put the, I'm going to put my star, my all-star point guard back in his right position because I was already in the basketball rhythm the whole year and the whole playoffs. I would have started him. And I could come off the bench because I'm already got, I already got a rhythm. I already, the ball feels like it felt when I was 11 years old. It's how it, that's how it felt then. It feels good to me. He had, Jameer would have had to, he has to find his basketball rhythm because he's been out for so long. So if I was coach, if I would do it again, I'd be like, start him because he's just started. He's been, he was an all star. He started the whole year. He's been starting since he came to sleep. Start him. You know, at that time, I was 33 years old. So it didn't make me a difference. <laughs> I just right. want to win. <laughs> Okay, and then that next year, 2009, you go to the New Jersey Nets. Yeah. Yeah, that was okay. bad. Yeah. That was bad. Well, you had your first triple-double. Against my uh, old team. Uh, yeah. I had my triple-double <laughs> against Orlando, but... Right. When I got traded to Orlando, to New Jersey, I thought I wasn't going to make it to training camp. I thought they was going to trade me again or buy me out and go somewhere else. And then that didn't happen until after we done lost a record number of games and then they set on a buyout. I ended up signing with the Miami Heat. The Miami Heat thing. So right when I was signing there, I was skeptic about even going there. Um, and then my mental mind state at that time is like, and I just I just bounced all over the place. I just left Houston for Orlando, New Jersey. All this happened in one year. Right, and and and, I, and actually, in a matter of months, uh, and then I had some off the court stuff. I was dealing with, you know, my sister had a situation. Now I don't want to share totally with y'all, but my sister had a situation. So I was dealing with so much that I went to Miami. I was playing. It was start me. I, I had I had messed up my wrist against New Jersey. So I messed up. I could we come back playing New Jersey. I messed up my wrist, so I could never regain the fluidity in my shot, in my wrist again. So I was struggling from the field. I'm struggling to shoot free throw because I couldn't, I was shooting like that. I couldn't snap my wrist like that. I was going like that. So I'm like, yo, I'm struggling, but you know, I could I, I could do everything else. Uh, the coach at the time takes me out of the star lineup and they're saying that you're not playing no more. Now, at this time, I'm dealing with so much. I'm dealing with things. Uh, even my cousin, who's my, right, who's so close to me, he ends up 
getting himself in the jam. So I'm dealing with so much, right? That at this time, the coach decides, you know, you're, we're done with you. So I said, wow. So I go from starting to, to not even come to bed. I go from starting to not playing at all. I said, so for, you know what? I'm dealing with so much at the time that, that I just left the team. You know what I'm saying? I just walked away. And then, you know, they're calling me. I'm not even answering their calls because I'm done. I'm like, duh, I'm done. I'm done getting bounced around. The respect, the respect of a somebody of an eleven year veteran at this time, y'all have no respect for eleven year veteran. You couldn't even you couldn't even talk to me about, okay, you're gonna come off the bench. You're just saying you go from starting, you're not playing at all. So you have no respect for me for what I've built up all the way to this point and the fact that I can help your team. Uh so I was and then I was dealing with so much off the floor, Vlad, that I was like, you know what? I just walked away. Um that's just probably the second dumbest thing I did in my basketball career besides the Eddie House slap. That was probably the second that was I was I still was I still done with them? Yeah. But I would have handled it a different way. Right? So I, I should have went back, I should have went to them and told them, I don't care what you guys want to do with me, I'm just done playing for this remainder of this year. But I probably should have handled it a different way. But you know, you know, that's just life, man. You live and you learn, man. You live and you learn. Yeah. Uh other than that, I have no regrets about my basketball career. I mean, the journey is a journey I put myself through. I was able to get myself out of it by, if you go back to high school and not playing, not going to school, you know, I, I would have had a storybook high school career, I, you know what I mean? As a sophomore in high school, I was 25 points per game. I played four or five games as a junior before I was ruled academically eligible. I was averaging 33 points a game. I do the same thing my senior year. I'm averaging 33 points a game, and I'm seeing I was only playing 18 minutes a game, and I was getting 33 points a game and 18 minutes of basketball, and I only played a handful of games then until I was ruled academic eligible. We know, so, but imagine if I did it the way I should have done in high school. What kind of right? I, what I what would I be? A, a McDonald All-American, a Parade All-American? I go to junior right. college. I handle my business. I go to Fresno State. I get drafted. It it all worked out. And I've had a lot of bumps in the road to where each one is a learning experience that I could share with the youth today. And I share with my youngest kid, my boys that play ball, that I could tell them the things to do to make it. And I could tell them things not to do because I was on both sides of it. Right. Because, you know, you, you know, you told the whole story about with Miami, you, you didn't show up to practice. You didn't make yourself available. No, nah, not return, at all. Return text messages, nothing. and then you were you were suspended indefinitely, and then essentially for the yeah, rest of the season. The, suspe pay the suspension was null and, to me was null and void because I pretty much I'm yeah. letting them know that I'm done. So you suspended somebody that's done. You know, yeah. it, it, that's what they should have said. But I know you know the professional way they got to say hey, we suspend them indefinitely. You know, but. Um, it happens, man. Like, and do I regret doing handling it that way? Of course, of course. Would I have still been done with the team playing? Yes, but that's not the way to go about doing it. You know what I'm saying? And that's what I say. So, I I could live. I can learn with it. I could look those men in the eyes and tell them I'm wrong. Right? Yeah, I have no problem doing it. I could. I could. I could. I I could do that then. But at the time, at the time, you don't have. They didn't have respect for me to. Okay. It's very, it's like this, Vlad. It's unheard of to go from playing 30 minutes to go from playing zero. It's unheard of. I don't care how bad you think the guy's playing. Then you're going to find him, a, you know what, your role, you're going to go, you're going to come off the bench. You're going you're gonna to play your 12 to 15 minutes off the bench. Let's put you in that role. All right, so you're not going to go that. On top of that, what everything else around me I was going through, which they had no clue about, it's just... Strip me of the one thing that I could keep my mind off of at that time. Strip it. It's, it's a, it was a bit much to handle because I'd have to handle, I'd have to go through that probably since I was a young kid. Now, like you said, probably since going through having to, you know, deal with your home life, your dad not being there, you know what I'm saying, navigating through the neighborhoods, you know, uh, I had to go through that type of uh, obstacle in over 20 some years, 30 years. Well, a couple months later, there was a situation in a strip club. Refresh my mind. <laughs> uh, well, they were, well, you were allegedly at the Perfection Strip Club. Oh, God. I love, I, you know, so crazy. If it's going to answer this, I love this one. 
Okay. <laughs> yeah, I love that. So, so according to reports, <laughs> uh, a guy named e Eric uh, Francesci. You can say his name 90,000 times. I don't know the guy. I don't even know him, but <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> uh, he claimed that a fight started inside the club, but then once you guys got outside the club, you hit him in the head with a bottle. Exactly. He had 12 staples in his head, and a year after the strip club incident, he sued you. Right. And he got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and it kind of find out I never hit him in the head. I don't even know the dude. So that he got into it with some friends of mine right inside the club. When he got into it with them dudes, I immediately went outside to my car. Mm -hmm. That was the end of it. <laughs> I was in, I, I don't know if I was in my Aston Martin or my Audi R8 at the time. I leave. I just leave. I'm like, man, let me get out of here, man, right? And my friends knew I was leaving. I don't even know until the next day that they still was fighting outside. Whatever happened, happened. Again, he decided to have a It was a money move for him that he was going to say, Ray for Olsen beat me up and hit me in the head with the bottle. When they asked the man, then when it came down to the, to the when it gets to, a lot of times, see, the, the problem with a lot of these people is, you got to answer to these accusations at some point when you go to court or you go to trial or you got to go to some civil court. You got to show proof. And the man don't even come and show up. The man says, forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the crazy thing, Vlad, is like I tell people, right now if someone accuses, I could say, yo, Vlad, beat me up, man. Knock my tooth out. You don't know that if I had a already loose tooth and I could pull my tooth out. And I know, like, it, you don't know that, right? You got to pay to defend yourself. 100%. So this is the part that, the only part I'm mad at. That that perfections, what happened at that nightclub that he's so-called trying to throw on me, and it happened at that other nightclub that you said uh, years ago, is that it cost me like 15, 20 grand to get a lawyer, the top flight lawyer in New York City. I had to get yeah. the I had to get the same lawyer for both of them situations, for him to go say, "Oh yeah, don't worry about it. You ain't got to come back to court no more. It's over with." What happened? He the kid. He he. Uh, when he, we, we we were gonna take him to trial, we were gonna force him to get on get on the stand and prove himself. He declined, so it's over. I said so. I said so. Wait a minute. Twenty thousand. That's it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I've been there, man. I, I feel your pain. Like, I'm so, I'm I absolutely sit, feel so your pain. That's the thing. And then not only for that is that now, like I said, no one asks you about the situation. When you go back to these teens, or if I go somewhere, until that thing is, until they show that, oh yeah, he was, a, he, he, them charges are gone. It, no one asks you about what happened, right? They don't side with the report before they even get. So the verdict or anything happens. Like you're like it's unfortunate because it's like, here I am, I gotta prove my innocence when I'm innocent the whole time. I'm innocent the whole time. Me personally, whenever I go out, man, people know me as a person that's gonna dance a lot. So I'm doing the stuff that guys that in my shoes will not do, Vlad. <laughs> like you know what I'm saying? Like NBA guys, rappers, they're not dancing. They over there looking tough. Right? They stand there with the meme mug, with the jewelry, looking like some, they in a nightclub trying to look like this tough gangster. Me, I'm going out there to dance. I'm trying to dance with the opposite sex, have a good time tonight, and go home. Right? I'm, that's what I'm doing. So for him to even say that, with the cameras in there, and the cameras outside, that's how this case, the perfectionist thing got, the camera showed me getting in my car leaving before he even comes outside the club. <laughs> so, and I guess once the lawyers actually showed the man that, it's like, yo, look, you really ain't got the camera showed the man leave and go in the club, get out in his car. And you can't even say I'm with somebody because I'm in a two seater. Mm. <laughs> they asked him, all, uh, I, I don't know if I was going to ask him, all, right, they small, uh, you know, sports cars. It's a two seater. So you see me get in my car. Go my way. Okay. So the next year in 2011, you actually go to China to play. Yeah. Uh, I cannot pronounce this team for the life of me. Uh, I can't. Oh, man. I can't think of the name. Uh, 
Okay, I'm going to butcher the name. I apologize to all my Chinese viewers it, right now. Uh, uh, Zhe Zhuang Guangsha? Guangzhou. Guangzhou. I think Guangzhou. It's like, I think it's like, like Guangzhou, yeah. Okay. So you go and play overseas. Yeah. yeah. And uh, you play eight games. You're averaging 19.2 uh, points a game, 3.3 rebounds, 3.4 assists. You're doing well. And then... You know, these stories come out that you faked an injury to try to get out of playing in China. That's not the case. Okay, explain. It, it, the, so the people put that story out there to try to cover their behind on why they didn't want me to return from what I was going to do for one day. And that I was paying my own way to leave and come back. I'm on a top three team in China. I'm one of the top players out there at the time. When I get it, I get off the plane. I got off the plane averaging them numbers. Right? So I'm getting off the plane. So them numbers are about to go up because one of my last games, we played against my childhood buddy, Stefan Marbury, and I had 31 points. So, you know, I don't know if that's any of the report, but one of my games was against my childhood buddy, and I had 31 points. Right. Who's, who's the king of China, by the way? Yeah, the the king of China. And I had 31 points against the king of China, which I was even shocked at myself. I'm like, oh, man, this man, I thought he was going to get all the calls. I thought you were about to kill, kill out here. <laughs> so I'm on a top three team, top three or top four team. We're going to playoffs. My close friend passed away, Troy Escalade Jackson, Mark Jackson's younger brother. This is a guy I hung out with all the time. All summer long, whenever the season's over, I hang out with Troy Jacks every day. I ask the team. I, it's not even about asking them. I'm letting them know, look, I need to go help bury my best friend, my close friend. I, need, I, ha that's, I am going to go do that. But I'm letting you know, I, wonder, I want the approval of you guys to let me go and come back. I'm going to pay my own way. Do you know how much a ticket on the spot is from China to New York, back to China? Do you know how much that costs? First class. First, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, 20000 it, 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 And I'm, I'm telling her, that, I'm going to eat that. You know the culture in China is, if it's not your immediate family, you shouldn't, be, you shouldn't go. Mm. This is what they was telling me. They said, I said, why you guys say They said, that's the, that's the culture there. So no matter what, I wasn't missing Escalade's funeral for nothing in the world. I wouldn't, that wasn't going to happen. That wasn't going to happen, Vlad. So what they do, they put out there, he faked the injury. I wasn't hurt at all. I was always, uh, I very rarely got hurt in my whole 11 year NBA career, but about maybe three, a handful of times, like three, three times or something like that. I played a lot of games. Uh, they also put out there, um, he didn't like the, he didn't like it here. Some they said, they said something like he didn't like it. Do you know I was in a best city? I was, in, I was in Hangzhou. Hangzhou was the number one city before Beijing and Shanghai got developed. Hangzhou is more Americanized than those cities. We have a, they had Italian restaurants. They had all kinds of restaurants. They had TGI Friday. They had all kinds of stuff there. So what part of that I don't like? I'm in, the, I'm in one of the best cities. It's Americans there teaching English to the Chinese kids in school. And so it, it, was a whole, it was a whole culture, the different cultures, ethnicities where I was living at. They put out there, I didn't like the, uh, what do you mean? Uh, but since then, I've been back there on numerous occasions, doing a lot of tour, and they 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 welcome me with open arms. Till this day, I, they want me to come back because once it got back, the whole that the people found out that that wasn't true what they put out there about Ray for Austin faking an injury to leave. It wasn't true. Right, and then after that, you came back to the U.S. Uh, you played for the for the Los Angeles uh, D League. But that was essentially the end of your NBA career. Did that G League thing was uh, the, so? The, how about this? So the same coach who didn't want to keep me in Golden State, he pulls my name out the hat for the LA Defender G League team. Now, why would you pull my name out the hat when you know you don't want to keep me? You're not going to play me in there or anything like that. Why would you do that? He had the audacity to even speak. To my agents, and I'm like, hey man, I'm gonna pull, I'm gonna, I see his name, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna get him. The same agent I had when you didn't want me to, when you let me go and go to state. Why are you doing this, Eric Musselman? Why would you do that? Why were you doing that? 
He has me come to the LA team. And Vlad, I'll tell you this, and if you ever had the chance to call any of my coaches, ask him, ask him was I ever out of shape? And they're gonna tell you that man, not only was he never out of shape, he was the number one guy in, in here in shape. Only one year, only one time in my career, my first three years, that one guy was in better shape than me. And that was my three years in Milwaukee. That was Ray Allen. Because Ray Allen, he was kind of, I would say, a, a notch above me in keeping himself in condition. But every team I've been on, Vlad, not one of these coaches could ever say, I came in that gym out of shape. I was the number one guy. We're doing sprints, number one. Play me, you could play me a whole game. I'm not ga I don't, I'm not gonna gas out. This man tells people he didn't play me because I came there out of shape. He know that wasn't the truth. He know that. So why first of all, we were at then that's what they before he he was telling my agent that my agent told me, I said, please tell him, don't pull my name out this hat. <laughs> Let the other teams get me. I'm gonna tell you the reason why he didn't pull that name, he pulled my name. He didn't want to face. He didn't. He didn't want to face me, because what happened was when he released me in Golden State, he had to face me when I played in Toronto, that 0203 year. He had that. They had to face me, and I had. I, I destroyed them. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? I gave them. I think I had like 20 points on on the Warriors or something like that. Something happened to where, and you could look at them. And they know. You, yeah, you made a mistake. You know. So. That's probably why he put my name. I don't. I, other than that, I don't know why. Cause I, if I'm a coach in a team, I'm not gonna pull a guy name. I know I'm not playing him. I have no, I have, I, I have no place to play him. It, it makes it makes no sense. Well, uh, Ray Frosty, man, quite a career. Eleven seasons in the league. Uh, the first guy to transition from street basketball to the NBA. Uh, I mean, really, you just broke a barrier that had never been broken before. And after that, were there any streetball guys who joined the NBA after you? Not that I can know. Not not a streetball guy that garnered the name, uh, who was classified as a streetball legend at such a young age. Remember, by the time I was 16, they was classified as a streetball legend. And it was, people think because it mainly rock apart, but because I didn't have the storybook career, most of my basketball was in all the tournaments in New York City. Well, I don't know if you ever heard of West 4th Street. Uh, you name a tournament at that time in the mid to late 90s in New York, I played them. I I made sure every time people would follow, they'll find out what team I'm on in some of these tournaments and they'll get to that part. I don't care if I was playing in the Bronx, Queens, Brooklyn, Manhattan, Long Island. They would get there because they're like, I got to watch this kid play. And I never disappointed them. So not that I know of that I can say. Um, what I can say is, there had there were a lot of these guys that had the ability to do so. For whatever reason, they didn't want to give themselves that chance to go do it. But there were a lot of guys out there that I ran across that. Woo, like man, he just, you know, uh, you know, it's a challenge, man. And one, I think I left that off through my journey is that it's a challenge, man, for a lot of guys that are talented basketball that that play predominantly street ball basketball to go and have to play in a structured, structured setting, and you never hone your skills on that. You never base your skills on being in the structure. See, my people, the thing with me was, from the time they injured the ball, I was always in a structured setting. The, I only did the playground stuff in the summertime. But throughout my travels, and I, and I always studied tapes on uh, a lot of basketball play, like so, I, I studied so much tape on Rod Strickland, Mark Jackson, Pearl Washington, Kenny, and so I always studied how to run a team, how to be the quarterback of a team. So, uh, but playing in the playground, man, it 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 it, it, it may be tough. Growing up in the environments I grew up, doing some of the things I had no business doing out there in New York City, in Queens, Southside, Big Queen, it again, it made me tough. It made me who I who I am today. And, and that's what helped me through my journey because I had some I had some tough times throughout the journey. There you have it, Ray for Austin, man, aka Skip to My Lou, man. Congratulations on a storied yeah, career, thank you, man. Uh, break, breaking boundaries, uh, and really being a, an inspiration, you know, to the, all the kids that are playing, you know, in the streets right now, you know, who who say, hey, one day I'm going to make it to the NBA, you know, until you came around, no one could really say that. 
Right. And now, and now there's an aspiration saying, okay, well, Rafer did it, so I'm going to do it too. Right. And 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 as you know, growing up and you know, as a kid, you know, you need the role models. If you don't have the role models are the goal that you you aim towards. Right. And if you don't have a goal, it's like playing with a blindfold on. You know, yeah, you might score accidentally, but most times, you know, more times than not, you're not, you're just gonna fumble. And you know, giving giving kids that that role model, that that target to go towards, I think is something that you could, you know, really be proud of for the rest of your days because you you really did it. You know, you made it to the NBA and you stayed at the NBA. It wasn't just like a little right. fluke where you were there for one season and then that was it. Nah, you were there. You got to the NBA Finals. You know, you were making it to playoffs. You played with some of the greats, some of the absolute greats, man. And you know, I really, truly appreciate you coming. Man, thanks for having story. me, man. Thanks for having me. Big fan of all your uh, interviews, man. I watch them day, every day. I check out if you came out with a new one, man. Uh, man, shout out to Vlad TV and everybody, man. Thank you, man. I truly appreciate it, man. Until next time. Yep. Peace. Peace.